subrings of number fields that is indeed the subject of my lecture and everything I will be talking about has been done jointly with several students at Leiden. So let me write down their names. That is first of all Dan van Gent and secondly Samuel Tiersma. Dan is a PhD student, Samuel is a master student sitting in the first row for troubleshooting purposes. And then there is a bachelor student called Jeroen Thuis, who is currently writing a bachelor thesis on one of the results that I will be discussing. Yeah, I am very pleased to have been invited to give this lecture at a meeting on arithmetic statistics. And I should mention that almost all statisticians whom I am acquainted with have the performance of experiments as their main, if not exclusive, <coughs> daily business. And if you want to do experiments, then you need to have algorithms. And algorithms, they happen to be one of my own interests. Now, the current lecture does not have algorithms as its main subject, although I will hopefully discuss a few of them. But I will mostly emphasize several issues in ring theory that were motivated by the desire to be able to construct algorithms. When I say algorithms, then I will exclusively think of efficient algorithms, and efficient algorithms, those are meant to be polynomial time algorithms. So before I get into algorithmic issues, let me acquaint you with the main topic of my lectures, which are the subrings of number fields. So I start from a number field, which I will typically call K, so that is a finite extension of Q, a field extension of Q, and in con the context of algorithms that will be typically given by an irreducible polynomial in one variable over Q. Then the main subring of K that I suppose all of you are acquainted with is the maximal order, the ring of algebraic integers in K, and that is what most basic causes on algorithmic number theory, on algebraic number theory, typically restrict to. They are, in a way, analogous to affine non-singular curves over finite fields. And more recently, there has been a lot of emphasis on extensions inside K of these rings of integers, those are the rings of so-called S-integers, of which I will give the definition a little later in the lecture. And those are, so S is typically, S is a set of non-zero prime ideals of A, where the main emphasis is on finite sets S, and sets of that nature give rise to intermediate rings, and in fact every intermediate ring is of this form. All of them are dedicate rings, and if S is finite, then a ring of that sort is just as analogous to an affine non-singular curve over a finite field as O itself is. Now it turns out that for the purposes of efficient algorithms, this ring of integers is of no use because there does not exist an efficient algorithm that people are aware of to determine O when K is given as input. That is even true if K is simply restricted to ranging over quadratic fields. If you want to determine 
rings of integers of quadratic fields that is equivalent to finding maximal square divisors of given positive integers, and that is a, a factoring problem for which people are not aware of the existence of any polynomial time algorithm. So for that reason, and that is what the work of Dan van Gent has been mostly devoted to, people typically consider algorithms for orders inside number fields, which I will call A. So these A's, they are subrings of finite additive index in O. So I really mean by this finiteness, not that O is a module of finite rank over A, but much stronger that O modulo A, which is a, an abelian group, is actually a finite abelian group. And even for the question of testing whether a given A is equal to O, no polynomial time algorithm is available. And in this lecture I will, just as you form OS from O, and because we cannot deal with O, we deal with this analogously defined AS, which I will now proceed to give definitions of. And if at a certain moment it will turn out that with an appropriate interpretation you have an inclusion between AS and OS. And in order to define AS, I first want to talk about S, and for this I need the notion of invertibility, and I look at an ideal I of A, and this is invertible. I am sure that most of you will know this definition. If it has an inverse, and this inverse, well, it certainly has an inverse. This inverse is the set of all x in K, such that x i is in A, and that is a sub-A module of K that contains A itself, and it should satisfy what you want an inverse to satisfy, namely that the product of I and I inverse is A. I will be talking about products of sets inside K. I will always mean the additive subgroup generated by all products X, Y, where X belongs to the first factor and Y to the second. So that is an invertible ideal, which will make their appearance also later in the lecture, but for the moment I am interested in invertible prime ideals. So if I have a prime ideal, so P is in the spectrum of A, then it turns out that the invertible prime ideals are, well, in the sense, the good ones. P is invertible if and only if the corresponding local ring, AP, which I consider as a subring of K, the field of fractions of K, if this is a discrete valuation ring, DVR means discrete valuation ring, so this is something that is true for all non-zero prime ideals, if and only if A is equal to O. And the exceptional P's that are not invertible are, apart from the zero ideal, exactly those that occur in this quotient O modulo A. And one way of saying this is that this invertibility is also equivalent to the map from AP to OP. You can localize O at P because O is an algebra over A, and the inclusion of A in O induces 
an inclusion of local rings, of the localizations, I mean, and this map should be an isomorphism, and that is for non-zero prime ideals equivalent to P being invertible. So those are the invertible primes, and if I look at this set S, then S is any set of invertible primes of A. That is the set S that I will be considering with special attention for the S's that are finite. And if you have an S like that, then AS can be described in several ways. One thing that you can do is that for each of those invertible primes in S, you look at the inverse of P, which I defined in general for invertible ideals, and all of those inverses which contain A, you adjoin them to A, so this notation stands for the ring generated by A together with the union of all of these P inverses. And this can also be described as the intersection of all of the localizations at the other primes. So if you look at all elements in the spectrum that are not in S and you intersect the localizations, then you get A, P. And this uh, set S that gives you a lot of structural information about the ring. So for example, you can see that a S is a dedicated ring, in fact, even only if A is equal to O. And you can see that S is finite, even only if this ring A S is of finite type over Z. Maybe I should write that down. S is finite, even only if A S is of finite type over Z, which means by definition that as a Z algebra, AS is generated by a finite set. And those are the ones that we will be doing algorithms for. Maybe I should also explain what I mean by this inclusion. Of course, OS has now also been defined when S is a set of invertible primes of O, and by this isomorphism between AP and OP, you see that there is exactly one prime ideal of O that lies over P, and they have isomorphic localizations. So if you call the set of those P's again S, then you have also an OS, and you have this inclusion relation, and in fact this OS will be the integral closure of AS in OS. Okay, and it is a fundamental theorem, which I sort of never realized until I started this entire project, that if I take any subring, any subring R of K, and actually I will restrict to the subrings of which K is the field of fractions, which means that the field generated by R, which is always the same as the Q vector space generated by R, if Q with QR equal to K, is uniquely of the form AS as above. Typically one of those theorems that should be 
in the textbooks, but I have never seen it there. So this means that for every subring, there is a unique pair consisting of an order of finite index in O together with a set S of invertible prime ideals of A such that R is equal to this AS. Okay, now when I want to do algorithms for such rings, then it is certainly necessary that I am able to specify such rings <coughs> using only a finite number of bits. And as you may see from this collection, it is clear that the number of subrings of any fixed number field is uncountable. But if you want to specify something with only finitely many bits, then clearly you can have only a countable collection. So we have to restrict the rings that we wish to look at and the perfectly natural class that I will restrict to in this lecture is the class of rings that are of finite type, which means, as I told you a moment ago, that this set S of invertible prime ideals of A is finite. And once you restrict your attention to such pairs AS, then it is also clear that there is a perfectly natural way of specifying such a ring using a finite number of symbols. Namely, well, first of all, you specify K, which I discussed at an earlier stage. Then you can, for example, specify A by writing down a finite number of elements of A, for example, that span A as an additive group. As an additive group, A is just isomorphic to Z to the N, where N is a degree of my number field over Q. And then in a similar way, you specify your prime ideals, of which there are only finitely many, and in that manner, you have specified this A S. And one of the uh, one of the tragical circumstances of the subject is that this is a totally useless way of specifying A S of specifying R because it does not enable you to answer almost any reasonable question in polynomial time. So, for example, suppose that I have that K is as a, vector, as a field extension of Q generated by some element alpha, then you can take the subring R generated by alpha, Z square bracket alpha. If alpha is an algebraic integer, then Z square bracket alpha will be one of our A's, but if alpha is not an algebraic integer, well, then if you want to represent it in this manner, then it is necessary to be able to intersect Z alpha with O. And there is no good algorithm available for doing that. If you would have such an algorithm, you could also determine O in polynomial time, and that is something that nobody can do. And even if you could find A, then there would be a further problem, and that is concerned with this P inverse. Maybe I should mention that if you have that this S is finite, if S is finite, then this AS can also be described by adjoining to A the inverse of a single invertible ideal, namely the product of the primes in S. And there is, well, this is mathematically pretty trivial, from, but from an algorithmic point of view, these things are very different because 
I can certainly multiply prime ideals and compute their product, but if I am given a product of prime ideals, then recovering those prime ideals is next to impossible. It comes down to factorization of ordinary integers into prime numbers. So that is a problem when you want to represent R's as pairs A comma S and how I do want to represent subrings of finite type in my algorithms. I will discuss a little later in my lecture, but for now I want to discuss a second way in which I do not want uh, to be specified to the algorithms. Any questions so far? Here is an example that you may want to keep in mind. If you take K to be the field generated by I, so that is the squ a square root of minus one, then you can look at the ring of integers, which is QI, I is my square root of minus one, so that is ZI, the ring of integers of Gauss, and you adjoin the inverse of one of the prime ideals lying over five. Then it turns out in this example that A is equal to O, and that S consists of a single prime ideal, namely the prime ideal of ZI generated by 2 plus i. And that is an example that I will refer to at several points in my lecture. And it is an example that, so to speak, destroys a second attempt of representing R, and that is the way rings have so far always been represented in algorithms. And let me tell you how this works. So typically, One represents a ring R in algorithms by first specifying the additive group of R, R plus. So by R plus I mean the additive group of R. And for most rings that people have been considering so far in this context, this additive group is perfectly straightforward to describe. I mentioned already this k is simply q to the n as an additive group, a vector space of dimension n over q, and o and a, both of them are as additive groups isomorphic to z to the n. And once you have a good way of specifying r plus and good means that it should come with a way of representing its elements as vectors over Q or over Z, then you specify the multiplication, next specifying the multiplication as a homomorphism from another group that you can concoct out of your given group simply the tensor product of this additive group with itself, taken over z if you like, and so if this is z to the n and that is z to the n, this will be z to the n square, and you write down a homomorphism that tells you how to how the multiplication works. And this works not just for the number rings that I described here, the A and the O and the K. It is also the way people go about doing this for finite rings, for, for example, for finite fields. You specify R plus as a vector space over the finite prime field. And other finite rings, well, R plus will be a finite abelian group. And you all know how you can explicitly describe those groups and compute the tensor products. Now, one of the discoveries that I made several months ago, and that was actually with Samuel Tiersma, that this is hopeless 
for example, for this ring that I used already as an example. And what do I mean by this being hopeless? Well, first of all, it means that if you just take a piece of paper and you draw in your complex plane represented by that piece of paper, what the elements of this ring look like, and you try to describe the additive group of what you are seeing, then you pretty soon discover that that is a completely hopeless affair, and that to the very best of my knowledge, maybe the only way of, re of describing the additive group, and certainly by far the easiest way of describing the additive group, is by doing it in the other direction. You first specify the ring, and then you say, well, my group is its additive group. So that means that, uh, that this approach won't work. Now, what uh, I have actually been able to prove uh, in this discussion with Samuel Tiersma that I mentioned, and I think that it took us uh, several hours to do so, is that there is a perfectly well-defined way in which this doesn't work, and in which it is, in a sense, necessary to specify the ring if you want to specify the additive group. And that, is, that depends on a notion that I did find only very little uh, literature about, and that is about the following. So this is a sort of a Cayley. There's a theorem from Cayley that everybody learns in group theory, stating that if you take any group G, then you can embed it in the symmetric group of the underlying set of G. And there is also a Cayley for rings, namely any ring R, it doesn't need to be a subring of a number field, any ring R embeds as a subring, it need not even be commutative, as a subring of the endomorphism ring of the additive group R plus. So R plus, that is the additive group. The endomorphisms of the additive group are simply the homomorphisms from this group to itself, and you add them pointwise, and you multiply them by composition. And the way you embed R is just as with Cayley, X goes, so R goes to left multiplication by R, and that is a injective ring homomorphism from R to R plus. And it turns out that there are cases, more cases than you might think, in which this map from R to R plus is actually an isomorphism. And we give this a name, I call R firm, for a reason that I will explain in a moment, if the map that I just defined is a ring isomorphism, which is equivalent to saying that it is surjective. So that means that once you know the additive group of R, well, then you also know the isomorphism type of your ring, namely this is the endomorphism ring. And let me tell you a few properties. Well, first maybe some examples. If I take any integer n, then z mod n z has this property, as you will easily see. You can also take any subring of Q. In fact, I just described all subrings of Q for you. If you take K equal to Q and O is Z, then you get all these subrings from sets of primes. And it's very easy to show that all of them are firm. And then I have also, if you take any prime number P, you uh, can look at the periodic integers. It so happens that all endomorphisms of this additive group are continuous, and it is very easy 
to show that this ring also has this property. This is an uncountable ring. What I do not know is whether there is a firm ring of cardinality larger than this one, maybe of arbitrarily large cardinality. So if you like constructing sick rings, try your hand with this notion. Okay, so if R is firm, and that is the reason I call it firm, then it has two properties that are almost immediate. The first is that it is rigid. Rigid means that the group of ring automorphisms is trivial. Those automorphisms would need to be in this endomorphism ring and that follows it, but it's also clear that it will be commutative. That is a very easy exercise. Somewhat more surprising, I found that is R is firm, that this is, well, it clearly implies that the endomorphism ring that we are talking about, since it is isomorphic to R, it will be commutative because it is firm, but the converse is also true. The, if the endomorphism ring is commutative, then R is firm. And that has a very pleasing consequence since that means that the firmness of a ring depends only on its additive group. So if you have another ring structure on the same additive group, then it will actually be isomorphic to the general R, because they are both isomorphic to n R plus. So one might say that Knowing R plus essentially tells you what R is. The only thing that you will still need to know the ring multiplication is simply the choice of a unit element in R. And you cannot pick any unit element of R. You have to pick an element that generates it as a module over this endomorphism ring. So those are the firm rings and what I proved with Samuel is that this example is indeed firm. So that means that if you manage to describe its additive group then it is too late to describe the ring structure because you know it already. And therefore, this is not going to be the way of describing these rings. Now, before I get to better ways of describing the rings, I would like to link this subject up to the subject of the meeting, the statistics, because it is our conviction that there should be a theorem stating that this is the typical behavior of subrings of number fields, whether or not they are of finite type. And to formulate such a result, I want to restrict to a simple case in which the theorem is especially transparent. So suppose that I have actually any field, k over q is a field, so a field of characteristic zero, and I restrict to the situation that k has exactly two subfields. And those subfields are q and k. So for example, the case of quadratic fields which is the case that Jeroen Thuis is writing his bachelor thesis about. It is clear that every field with this property will have to be a finite algebraic extension of Q, and those extensions are often called primitive in the sense that the permutation group that goes with it is acting primitively, 
And it is, for example, true not just for quadratic extensions, but also for extensions of prime degree and for extensions of which the Galois closure has group, the full symmetric group Sn with n at least 2. Okay, now suppose that we take a subring in there and let R in K be a subring that is not contained in Q. So then its field of fractions will have to be K because there are no other subfields. Then the typical behavior is that R is firm and if it isn't firm then R is integral over its intersection, let's call it A, well let's call it B, is the intersection of R with Q and this is really exclusive but not both and why is it exclusive? Well if R is integral over this uh, B then it is easy to show that in this case R is free as a B module of rank N where N is the degree of K over Q and all endomorphisms of R will be B linear so that means that the endomorphism ring of the additive group will be isomorphic to the ring of N by N matrices over B which is not commutative because N is at least 2. So there you have a theorem that to my feeling implies that it should be possible by maybe putting some suitable probability distribution on all of those subrings to prove that most of them are firm. This is pretty exceptional behavior, this integrality. You can express it as a property of the spectrum of R, but I do not want to say too much more about this. Let me just tell you two things that you can do with this theorem. One thing is that you can generalize it to other number fields, then it looks a little bit more complicated, but there is a similar theorem with a similar conclusion. And secondly, you can also formulate a theorem of this sort where you are not talking about the homomorphisms between the additive group of R plus, the additive group R plus and itself, but you take a second ring, you take another number field K prime and you take a subring R prime in there and you are interested in the homomorphisms of the additive group of the first to the additive group of the second. And then the typical behavior is that this homomorphism group is simply the zero group. Something exceptional, similar to this integrality needs to happen before you have non-trivial homomorphism. Okay, so, so much about the manners in which we do not wish to represent our rings. And what I will do in the rest of the lecture is that uh, I will specify R by writing down K, I told you how to specify K, and a finite set T in K And then this should give rise to the ring 
generated by T, for which I write Z square bracket T. And if I want to satisfy my usual condition that the field of fractions of R is equal to K, then you want to restrict to sets T that generate K at least as a field, as a field extension of Q. Okay, and then the question is, okay, this is certainly a natural way of specifying finite type rings, and in fact I've been doing that already with this ring, this Z, 1 over 2 plus I, but it gives rise to several problems of interest. And before I get to ways of algorithmically dealing with rings of this sort, I would like to write down an elementary fact which you may view as an exercise. One may assume, well, let me first uh, write down something that is pretty trivial, namely that the cardinality of T is no more than the degree of the number field for which I write N. And why is that? Well, you can look at the additive group generated by T, and that is uh, a free abelian group of rank no more than N, and there are perfectly straightforward and efficient algorithms to find a basis for that group. And clearly, if two T's generate the same additive group, then they will also generate the same ring. So that is... Uh, that is the proof of this fact, and it is only a little harder, but it is a slight trick, and even at most n minus 1, if n is at least 2. In that case, you have to sort of get rid of one of the basis vectors of uh, the additive group generated by T, and that is something that also came up when I was working on this with Samuel uh, Tielsma. And it told me something that I was not previously aware of, and I haven't been able to find it in the literature, but it is sort of an interesting corollary, namely any subring of finite type of a quadratic number field is of the form Z alpha. It is monogenic. It is generated by a single element because n is 2 minus 1 is 1. And that is, of course, a very well-known fact, even as an abelian group, that if you have an order in a number field, it is just of the form Z plus Z alpha and therefore certainly of this form, but even when you allow a finite number of denominators, as I have been doing here, then this is still true, and the proof turns out to be perfectly elementary, at least the third proof that we found was perfectly elementary. The first one took a whole afternoon. If anybody knows a reference for this, I will be very happy to be told. Any questions? Okay. Now, if you write down a ring in this manner, well, then clearly it does not have the uniqueness properties that you have in the theorem on the upper blackboard, but you can at least ask if I give you two sets T and T prime, can you decide whether you get the same ring from T and from T prime? 
by means of an efficient algorithm? And the answer is yes, but it is not completely trivial, and it follows from another very fundamental question, namely, how can I decide whether a given element of K belongs to R? And it turns out that questions of that nature are perfectly trivial when you describe your rings as this AS, specifying A and S, but as I told you, there is no way we can do that. However, there is a poor man's version of such a result, and that is the following. So, fact. There is a, well, this is DPTA, that means a deterministic polynomial time algorithm, in other words, a fast and practical way of doing the following. And that algorithm, what does it do? That on input K, that is a number field, and T, K, so T in K is a finite set. Uh, finds an order A in K and an order A in K, by that I always mean what I wrote down here, a subring that is additively isomorphic to Z to the N, where N is a degree. So a subring of finite index of the ring of integers. And those invertible prime ideals we can forget about, but we can look at ideals and an invertible ideal I in A such that the ring that we are interested in, so that is ZT, is actually described in a way that is similar to what I did here. This AI, except that there is no way in which I can guarantee that I is a product of invertible prime ideals. So that is A to which you adjoin I inverse. This is certainly not unique, but this is something that can be done. And let me give you first an example. What I hope to do is give you a brief description of the algorithm. And if you apply that to the situation that uh, T is just a single element generating my field, then it turns out that the A that you get out of it is an order that has made its appearance already in several contexts in the recent past, in particular in the number field sieve algorithms. This is the ring generated by alpha intersected with the ring generated by alpha inverse. It is a theorem that for any non-zero alpha generating the field, this is an order in the field. And I, that is the denominator of alpha, that is the set of uh, x in A for which x alpha is in A. And that turns out to be an invertible ideal in this ring, and it has the desired property. And the algorithm that proves this fact is actually easier to state than to prove correct, but let me 
for reasons of time. Just tell you the algorithm, namely, you take J, that is an additive group, that is the group generated by what I told you about this elementary fact, but I adjoin the unit element to T. So this is the group generated by 1 and T. And I take A to be J to the N minus 1, N is a degree, and J to the N minus 1 is J times J times J, etc., with N minus 1 factors, where the multiplication is as I explained it before. So that is an additive group, and I look at the multiplier ring of that additive group. So that is the set of all x in k, which you can efficiently compute, that multiplies this fractional ideal in itself. That is a, and then i is simply the inverse of the J ideal, of the A ideal generated by J. And that works, and it is polynomial time, and the fact that it works follows from results that you can find in the writings of Daan van Gent. Once you are this far, it is very easy to decide when you are also given an alpha in K, whether alpha belongs to the ring. All you need to check is that a suitable power of I, and you can give bounds for that I, is sitting inside the denominator ideal of your alpha. So you see that at least several basic questions on what you can do with such rings have been answered already. There are several other basic ones that are yet to be considered, but I think that with an eye on the clock, I should stop here. I thank you for your attention.